A hundred thousand creepy crawlers. Spiders that will cover your whole face. All collected from the far reaches of the world. Wait, is it alive? Talk about a bug's life. Walt Disney went into the museum and wanted to buy the collection. But there's a bigger story behind this bizarre bequest. That was an interesting and eye-opening experience all of its own. Colby, and right now I'm driving on the outskirts of Colorado Springs, Colorado. I'm looking for the turnoff to a strange inheritance, which includes, believe me, one of the most unique collections. And my marker? It's a giant beetle. Hi, Jamie. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? So nice to my meet name you. is RJ Steer. In 2007, my grandfather, John May, passed away and left the largest privately owned collection of insects in the world. At the time, I didn't know what the rest of the family might want to do with it. It's housed in this little museum, nestled in a small canyon. It's one of those classic American roadside attractions. Of all the strange things you might like to inherit one day, wow. a few thousand drawers, canisters, and cases full of bugs is probably not on your list. Would it change your mind if I told you it's been appraised for millions? Somebody tells you you're sitting on how much in terms of value of this collection of insects. There are some insects that have never been seen since. There are some insects that are thought to be extinct but not confirmed. But the collection was assessed between five or six million dollars. For bugs? For this collection. This whole place feels like a time capsule. To the May family, the collection is a priceless legacy, but I learn it's also a scientific marvel of sorts. You must be Jamie. Hey, are you Sam? Sam, Sam Johnson has been coming to the May Natural History Museum for more than six decades. The museum inspired a childhood passion that paved the way for a career as an entomologist and high school biology teacher. I bring my biology classes here every year and we look at literally the best examples in the world. This place is old school. Wooden display cases with gooseneck lamps, the handwritten descriptions, and a collection that includes many insect species that have never been seen again. I've never seen so many insects. Each carries with it this incredible story about its niche in its environment. Have we spanned the globe here? Oh, absolutely. It's from everywhere. The story behind this collection is almost as spine-tingling as this spider, which happens to be where the tale begins. It was captured by the original benefactor of this strange inheritance in 1903. James May was a British national who fought in the Second Boer War in Africa. He was shot, wounded, and left for dead. Thankfully, May's life was saved by a tribe of Zulus, and during his convalescence, he passes away the hours enjoying a boyhood pastime, bug collecting and pinning. When he regains his health, he continues a life of adventure, which includes his obsession with bugs. R.J. Steer is James' great-grandson. He immigrated to Canada, which was still part of the British crown at the time and worked as a park ranger in Manitoba and hunted big game and also continued to avidly collect. James gets married and has three sons, only one of whom, John, born in 1915, shares James' love for bugs. Carla Harris is John May's daughter. He went on trips with his father collecting around Canada. He certainly supported his father that way and loved the collection. When the Great Depression hits, James loses his job as a park ranger and money is tight. But his teenage son, John, who, unlike his father, has a head for business, figures out how to turn dad's unusual hobby into a money-making venture as a traveling bug exhibit. John May learned how to create airtight wooden display cases from an old German cabinet maker and the practical realities of traveling with a, a collection 
By 1930, the entire family hits the road in both Canada and the U.S. with their traveling displays of bugs, all fronted by 15-year-old John May. He was a teenager, and he had grown men working for him. There's a whole group of men who were working as roustabouts, and they were destitute. So he helped a lot of people along the way, and he also intrigued a lot of people with this <laughs> collection. He wanted it to be interesting to the general public, and I really think he did a good job of it. By 1936, John starts his own family with wife Vicky, and before you know it, their three daughters join the entourage as they bounce from fairground to exhibition hall, with many of their shows drawing standing room only crowds. I remember Topeka, Kansas a lot, and uh, Des Moines, Iowa, those were big fairs. We went to expositions for Madison Square Garden. We were in Rockefeller Center. While John focuses on expanding their traveling show, his father, James, collects more specimens, often by trading them through the mail. Insect collectors of the time relied heavily on missionaries in Borneo, or maybe the local postmaster in the middle of Africa somewhere, and they just swap specimens. And so it goes through the Depression. But by the early 1940s, after more than a decade of living like nomads, the May clan is ready to settle down, John and Vicky in particular. Whenever we were at a fair, my mom, she'd have to find water spigots and haul buckets of water to wash our clothes. He wanted a permanent museum so he wouldn't have to continue the very strenuous fair circuit. During their travels, the entire May family fell in love with Colorado scenery. But there's another reason John bought a piece of ranch land here. Colorado is the perfect location. It's already a dry climate, so the specimens are preserved much better. True to form, John May designs the museum that would exhibit his father James May's collection. John even helps build it himself. RJ, an architect, is amazed at what he was able to do. My grandfather literally taught himself the building techniques in order to construct it. He figured out how to salvage, reuse, adapt any pieces or parts that he could get. With an eye to the future, the shrewd businessman insists on paying extra for something he figured he needed to expand his roadside attraction. He arranged and made sure of the water rights. He built six reservoirs, a series of ditches. Accordingly, all learning, of course, how to operate the heavy machinery to do so. On May 1st, 1952, the May Natural History Museum opens its doors. The May family is finally home, only to lose their master bug collector when he dies in 1956 at the age of 72. We probably have somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 specimens. And more or less my great-grandfather's legacy is that he is the one who collected essentially all of it. The future of this strange inheritance is in the hands of John May, who has even bigger plans for it. Those plans include the biggest name in theme parks. Walt Disney wanted to buy the collection. That's next. But first, our strange inheritance quiz question. How long is the longest insect in the world? Is it seven inches, 22 inches, or 36 inches? The answer in a moment. Now, the answer to our strange inheritance quiz question. How long is the longest insect in the world? It's B, 22 inches. That's the record length of a Chan's mega stick with its front legs extended. When James May, one of the world's leading bug collectors, dies in 1956, his son John takes charge of the collection. John's already built a museum in Colorado to display his dad's bugs, but now has bigger aspirations. So it's with keen interest that John reads in the paper that the great Walt Disney is in Colorado. John gets in touch and invites him to the museum with the idea that maybe he can lease Disney part of the Maybug collection and it could be a hit at Disneyland, which had opened the previous year. To everyone's delight, Walt himself agrees to a visit. John's daughter Carla, who's 13 at the time, is there when the legend arrives. 
Walt Disney went into the museum, and uh, Dad took them all through the collection, and I trailed around behind watching this whole thing. And he was very impressed. He wanted to buy the collection. John sees an opening. He and Disney discuss terms. John only wants to lease it with his father's name on it. Walt stands firm. Sale or no deal. Dad said, if we do sell it, will we at least get credit? Will there be a plaque saying this is James Frederick William May's collection and this sort of thing? And Disney said, no, they don't give credit to anything in Disneyland. It's all Disney. John walks away, but like Disney expands in Florida, the May family opens a second bug museum in the popular theme park, Wikiwachi Springs. He straps his signature beetle onto his pickup and drives it cross country. What did you think as kids when you had this big beetle to transport on top of the car? <laughs> well, it's a real traffic stopper. <laughs> it really is. But there he is. He thought if he could lease in a good location, we would make a lot more money. But there he had to build special cases out of metal. I mean, it was a major project to be able to display without the whole collection being destroyed. Ultimately, John May's venture in Florida runs into the same problem he faced with Disney. The reason that we left Florida was because ABC Paramount took over Wikiwachi Springs and they didn't want us there privately. They wanted to either buy it or we had to leave. In the mid-1960s, John carts his bug collection back to Colorado, but the experience makes him realize he needs more than a bug museum to draw customers, so he decides to put in a campsite. The original parcel was 180 acres. My grandfather uh, added on to the land whenever anything became available, somewhere in the neighborhood of 950 acres for all of it together. Eventually, he built on the plateau above the museum, and we ended up with 500-site campground. Thank goodness he tied up those water rights decades before. Now his bug museum is not just a place for science buffs or curious road trippers. Tack on the campground, and it's an overnight adventure. The Hercules beetle statue, which made the trip back from Florida, is an irresistible draw. Inside the museum, there's a 17-inch walking stick bug, moss with a 10-inch wingspan, butterflies in every color of the rainbow, and the black widow spider that entomologist Sam Johnson says deserves its deadly rep. So the black widow is not just a myth? No, it's not a myth at all, uh, although the, the toxicity, it varies from individual to individual, but they've killed a lot of people. I had a friend who was this close to dead before the EMTs got there and saved her life. Okay, these bugs are giving me the creeps. Even before Sam Johnson insists I try my hand at bug pinning. So Sam, pinning 101 and you had to pick locusts. Oh, you had to pick the locusts? <laughs> I just couldn't resist. Luckily, Sam is joking, and we move along to something more tolerable. If I see correctly, you pick something well, much more beautiful. Yeah, yeah. This is a Wiedemeyer's Admiral. This is a butterfly. Beautiful butterfly. So we can spread its wings like that. And all we have to do then is take a pin. And I can put a pin not through the wing, but right next to the wing. See how you do here. Put the pin just like I did through that paper. And just right through there. That's good. Real hard. Good. You're like a lepidopterist. All right, at least I got through one. For decades, the museum, with its quaint old-fashioned displays, continues to chug along, with an aging John in charge and various May family members working at it full-time. But as the 21st century gets underway, interest in the museum and campground steadily drop off. And after Vicki, John's faithful wife and fellow adventurer, passes away, it becomes clear to their kids that running a museum and a campground isn't easy for an octogenarian. He didn't like to delegate authority. He wanted to do it himself. And so as he was declining in his last years, he couldn't do those things anymore. And during that time, the ranch began to degrade. On November 4th, 2007, John May dies in his sleep at the age of 92. I was in the kitchen quietly doing dishes. He was in the room next to me. I could hear him breathing. And all of a sudden, I heard my mother, who had died in 2000, clear as a bell, saying, we're going to leave soon, and walked into the room, and he died. My feeling was they were off to explore the universe. 
Now John's earthbound heirs face a quandary. The Bug Museum is theirs, but can it survive? My family was contending with a tremendous amount of stress. That's next on Strange Inheritance. Here's another quiz question for you. A bug called the Maricopa Harvester has the most toxic venom in the world. Is it a killer spider, a killer ant, or a killer bee? The answer when we return. And now the answer to our quiz question. What's a Maricopa harvester, the bug with the most toxic venom in the world? It's an ant found in Arizona. Its venom is more powerful per sting than any other insect. In 2007, when insect impresario John May dies, he leaves behind a strange inheritance, a museum that contains thousands of bug specimens from around the world. Many rare, some extinct. The museum's collection has been appraised at between five and six million dollars. But with dwindling attendance, the May family is doubtful the museum can survive. Carrie York worked throughout the years with grandfather John May, maintaining the museum's grounds. Since the 70s, there have been a lot of changes. So I knew that I needed to increase my electric service and build new picnic tables. I had a thousand things I wanted to do and, you know, couldn't because of time and finances. The infrastructure isn't the only thing that's been declining. The books are a handwritten model. What needed the most improvement in the way he ran the business? Everything was tied together. Everything was convoluted. And that was quite a transition, especially throughout the uh, inheritance phase. Even more challenging, in the fall of 2008, Americans are told we're on the verge of a second Great Depression. Over the next couple of years, business slows to a crawl. By early 2012, it's painfully clear. Something has to be done. My mom had to contend with a tremendous amount of stress. From the time of the first Great Depression, when their grandfather and great-grandfather took their show on the road, those bugs had supported the May family. Was it finally time to fold up the tent? I asked each person in turn what they thought they wanted to see happen to the existing operation and what they wanted out of it. That was an eye-opening experience all of its own. Find out what happens as the family sits down over tea to have a civilized talk and the financial gusher that makes them all think twice. There's a joke in Colorado that whiskey's for drinking, but water's for fighting. That's next on Strange Inheritance. Now, back to Strange Inheritance. Four years after the death of family patriarch John May, the Natural History Museum, which bears his name, is limping along. During a family meeting in February 2012, the heirs have to decide what to do. Should they sell the land, close the bug museum? And if they keep it open, how are they going to get it back in shape? That's when they realize John May's true genius, tying up all those water rights decades ago when he purchased the land for his museum and campground. There's a joke in Colorado that whiskey's for drinking, but water's for fighting, because water is so valuable. The estimated value of the land with that water? They're told $25 million. So what would you do? Millions from the water, millions from the land, millions perhaps from the bug collection too? I'm with you. I'm thinking it's time to take the money and run. The heirs of James and John take a vote. It's unanimous. The water money would be used to keep the operation going. All eight of us essentially said the same thing, nearly word for word. And with such a unanimity, there was just really no question that it was worth a shot. R.J. Steer, grandson of John, great-grandson of James, gives up his career as an architect to head the operation. In the back of your mind, did you think to yourself, okay, we'll take a shot, but it's not going to be easy. We are literally standing in one man's 50 years of effort and creation, and it takes a lot to get up off the floor, dust yourself off, and find things that need improving and things that need ending. 
the May legacy will soon find itself being fulfilled by a fourth generation, all of them united by these crazy, creepy crawlies. You hear very commonly when a business owner dies, his children start fighting about it, or they start selling it off right away, or they run it into the ground. All of us are all totally invested in keeping the business going, keeping the museum open for people to enjoy. The heirs to this strange inheritance all vividly recall their grandfather, James May, trusty butterfly net in hand, fascinating them with his stories and adventures of insect hunting. He explained that most of the bugs he collected were docile, they were not poisonous, and they were even big enough to easily get a hold of. Like the fella over here, the Hercules beetle, it can lift 850 times its own weight, making it the strongest creature on Earth for its size. Try finding a roach motel big enough for a family of those. I'm Jamie Colby for Strange Inheritance. Remember, you can't take it with you. Do you have a strange inheritance story you'd like to share with us? We'd love to hear it. Send me an email or go to our website, strangeinheritance.com.